Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. We are well into the insan- insanity that is draft season, both NHL draft, expansion draft. Um, that would have been enough on its own, you know, with the amount that we have going on and the fact that everything is pushed to July this year, which is typically vacation time. Everyone's trying to enjoy their summers. That would have really been enough to probably keep us up for the next two weeks on its own. And then the NHL GMs just decided to go buck damn wild over the past five days and by all rights are going to continue to do so. I need to probably just start a a constant stream of like Red Bull from my front door all the way up to the office, the the studio where we record the podcast. I, I fear for us, uh, Brad and Evan, I'm assuming one of us will die uh, during these next couple of weeks. So it has been Definitely a time knowing you. Uh, we have known each other and said a lot of words over the past six years, and that's about as much as I can say on that. What hour do you leave uh, for the weekend? I need to know when the major Red Wings trade or whatever it's going to be is going to break. <laughs> it's uh, So I think Friday at around 11 11 30 a.m that's when i'm going to try to sneak very stupidly sneak a vacation in before the draft preview posts before the expansion draft stream and then episode and before the uh nhl draft streams and then episode so i don't know why i'm doing this because i'm a glutton for punishment but brad's right um same as what happens to max all the time I'm going to leave for vacation Friday at 1130. I will not have wonderful signal where I'm going. So expect every trade, every signing, every, everything possible to come from then on. They'll probably, they'll probably retire Fedorov's number in that window. I'm not going to lie to you. I can already envision the conversation we're going to have. Like the Red Wings traded Tyler Bertuzzi to so-and-so for so-and-so Friday at 5 p.m. I I text Ryan, hey, Bertuzzi's gone or whatever the thing is. And then Ryan's like, shit, what do we do? We have to do something because our Sunday episode is being pre-recorded tomorrow. So there would be nothing in that episode about it. So we're doing our special draft review. So Sunday's episode is intended right now to be only draft stuff for the most part. So I know, I know something's going to happen beyond a shadow of all doubt. Ryan's going to call me be like, dude, you need to get something on like YouTube now. And I'll just be sitting there with two kids in my lap crying, trying to talk about <laughs> whatever the hell happened. You know what? We've learned that we can't play God. It's a podcaster's curse. It's a content creator's curse. We just have to lay down and take our punishment. All right. Uh, welcome to the Winged Wheel podcast. Uh, scared. Very, very scared. I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Cresco. And I'm Evan. So uh, I'm going to walk us through a little bit of what uh, Winged Wheel podcast listeners and patrons can expect over the next few days, including this episode, uh, because it is going to get a little bit hairy here. So this episode features a uh, a very fun mock draft that we did with uh, Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit, as well as Prashanth Iyer. Um, love doing that with them. You'll hear once we, the interview comes in here, uh, we gave him a little bit of a hard time that the technology of recording remotely just didn't want to cooperate today. Um, so today is the uh, final mock draft and some big NHL news. Sunday is going to be uh, the NHL draft preview episode. Probably Monday night, we are going to have something out for the, it's going to be a quick hit, a bonus episode um, talking about the expansion draft lists. Uh, that will be released on Sunday. We'll talk about them on Monday night. Wednesday. Wednesday night, there is going to be an NHL uh, expansion draft live stream. So we'll be live streaming during the Seattle expansion draft covering uh, what happens as Seattle picks through the other 30 teams because Vegas isn't included. Directly afterwards, we're going to record an episode and post that late Wednesday night. Next Friday is the NHL draft live stream, uh, which of course will be open to everyone as well. Saturday will be the uh, day two of the NHL draft stream for patrons where we do our, our hangouts. So we'll figure out if we're doing that on Zoom or Discord or whatever. And then Sunday will be the NHL draft uh, recap episode. So 
Whew, I feel like I talked enough for a whole episode there. Quite a lot to come. Uh, Brad and Evan, are you guys ready for all of that? Absolutely not. <laughs> yes, I was born ready for this. Just kidding. Oh, I actually answer- took the weekend off. I'm I'm ready. Like, I don't work again until Monday. All right. So lots of content coming your way. Thank you guys for bearing with us as things get a little bit uh, upside down here. Uh, suffice it to say, we're very much looking forward to future years where um, things are happening in June, mostly. And it's a little bit easier. But hey, we're not going to complain about good hockey content. Uh, before we get into the episode, I want to talk to you about the Jamie Daniels Foundation. The more we talk about substance use disorder, the faster we can end the stigma and get support to those in need. The Jamie Daniels Foundation is a children's foundation initi- initiative, uh, and it was established in memory of Jamie Daniels and founded by Jamie's mother, or father and Red Wings lead announcer Ken Daniels and Jamie's mother, Lisa Daniels Goldman. They strive to end the stigma of substance use disorder and provide support to those struggling with the disease or who are, who are in recovery. To learn more and support the Jamie Daniels Foundation, visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org. All right, uh, some major pieces of hockey news that require attention uh, before we jump into the mock draft. Red Wings fans will have looked uh, at this trade with eager eyes just for pure entertainment purposes, and we're going to take this as objectively as possible. The Chicago Blackhawks did indeed trade Duncan Keith to the Edmonton Oilers, as we talked about last episode. So the final trade was Duncan Keith and Tim Soderland, who is an AHLer, uh, no cap retained at all to the Edmonton Oilers. And in exchange, the Oilers sent to the Blackhawks, Caleb Jones, and a 2022 conditional third round pick that turns into a second round pick if the Oilers make it to next year's cup finals and Keith is top four in playoffs time on ice during the first three rounds. So... Have a pretty nuanced and heavy condition there. So by all rights, that is a third round pick with Caleb Jones. I'll leave it to you guys for an initial reaction here. Okay. I will cover this from Ken Holland's perspective first. So Duncan Keith analytically, statistically, however you want to look at it, was terrible last year. One of the worst defensemen in the league. Is Duncan Keith actually that bad? Probably not. He was asked to play a very large role at an advanced age on a bad team. That's going to tank anybody's analytics. So um, it's worth noting that he's he's probably bad. He's probably just not as bad as the numbers would reflect. Him playing on a better team in a lesser role should benefit him. Even though he's getting older, I, I would expect to see some improvement on the Oilers given who he's going to be playing with. And I want to say a lesser role, but he's <laughs> Dave Tippett's as old school as they come. So I, if Duncan Keith ends up top two on this team in ice time for defensemen, I would not be shocked. Not the likely scenario, but I would not be shocked. But again, I'm going to go on the assumption they utilize him correctly. The Oilers have problems advancing and, you know, their leadership core is young. So whether or not you buy into the intangibles, Duncan Keith has that. And he's going to help with that. I don't care what anybody says. There is value to that. Now, how much is very much up for debate. So I get what Ken Holland was doing here. The The thought process of acquiring Duncan Keith for the Oilers makes a lot of sense, honestly. Guy who's been there, done that, can probably still be serviceable and can help mentor a very young leadership core on this team. Absolutely, positively understandable. They got wrecked on this trade and uh, absolutely screwed themselves for the next two years. Is Caleb Jones a premium prospect? No. If everything goes immaculately right for him, he might be a second pairing defenseman. And even that's optimistic. We know the statistical odds on third round picks. That's a 10% chance of an NHLer. Okay, that's a throw in. The biggest asset Edmonton gave up here was $5.2 million in cap hit the next two. No salary retained is staggering to me. 5.5 more. 5.5. It's even worse. 5.5 million over the next two years on a team that's already tight to the cap. And has problems surrounding their star forwards with 
competent forwards. So their solution was to get an overpriced, overaged defenseman. And they couldn't even get Chicago to take like a contract back in Koskinen. And again, I, from a value standpoint, this is a horrific trade as much as I want to give Ken Holland the benefit of the doubt. But really, what really cemented the lunacy of this for me was his press conference where he said, well, if they retain salary, we would have to pay more. Well, yeah, no shit, but you already paid too much. And then he said, what, you didn't think we'd get him for free? At his age, with his numbers and his cap hit, you probably actually could have. Um, Mark Stahl was a very serviceable defenseman who brought a lot of veteran leadership and intangibles to the Detroit Red Wings last year, and they received a second-round pick to get that um, with no salary retained on his one year left on his contract. And the whole air of how Ken Holland was talking, it, it sounded like not making the trade wasn't an option. I'm sorry, what? If Chicago was demanding uh, the ludicrous price that they were, you don't make the trade. I used Mark Stahl as a good example of how you can acquire a depth defenseman who brings all the leadership and intangibles you would like. Mark Stahl himself is a UFA right now. You could probably have had him for a million dollars on a one-year contract and got a lot of what you want Duncan Keith to be. Um, not that Mark Stahl was ever Duncan Keith, but I'm just saying at this point in their careers, it's a very insignificant margin. So now Edmonton's even more screwed to the cap. Connor McDavid doesn't have any more help. They lost a half-decent defensive prospect. They lost another draft pick, and their cap hit is royally screwed. So... Man, like you want to give Ken Holland the benefit of every doubt, but he just keeps making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And let's not forget, he's already massively overpaid Zach Cassian since he's got to Edmonton. So this isn't even a trend that's just carrying over from Detroit and reemerging now. It never went away. It's so peculiar, right? Because this is the same guy who made the Tomas Tatar and Brendan Smith trades, which were absolute hauls for Detroit. I mean, not every trade he made in Detroit. Obviously, he made some pretty terrible ones too, but not every trade he made was this bad. So I, I really struggle to see how Ken Holland is coming out and saying, well, then we'd have to pay more or did you want me to get him for free? You know, unless it's just GM speak. He seemed pretty candid. I don't understand how he buys into that, but then swings that much for Tatar. Or, you know, that much for Brendan Smith. Like, he's, he's having these things done to him, what he did to other GMs previously. For me, it's, it's, I, I'm big on, I don't think Keith is, is, I don't think the, his, his reputation or his leadership is worth, honestly, the roster spot at times. Like, bottom pairing, maybe, but like, he should not be a main fixture. But uh, some people are advocating for Keith. Sure, fine. I'm not even going to talk about the player. I agree with you, Brad. He does have that tangible value. For me, it's it, this, this is terrible on so many fronts. For the reasons Brad outlined, they they went completely in the opposite direction as to what they should have paid. They sh they honestly should have received compensation, and I stand by that. You add the fact that Keith wanted to come to Edmonton. So Edmonton knows they have leverage there. That's the only way they can get – that. they're one of the only teams that Chicago could move him to where he would agree to go there because it's a family thing. It's not a preference. He can't be swayed. He wanted to be closer to his son. They also know that Chicago wanted to clear space. Chicago wants to clear space for these major UFAs, for these major trade targets. Chicago is looking to contend. This is a team with two major factors squeezing them. And not only did they not leverage, not only did Ken Holland not leverage that, he got leveraged. It went in the complete opposite direction. Even if Chicago only gave up a seventh to move Keith, he would, uh, Ken Holland would be getting a ton of criticism, but he gave up a third in Caleb Jones. And yes, it's not the end of the world. And at the end of the day, it won't really matter in the grand scheme of what assets you're moving out. But you add that to the cap hit that you're taking on for two years. It's just a bad trade. It is bad practice as a GM. And you know what? I, I, as a Red Wings fan who is really heavy on Ken Holland, I really criticize Ken Holland in his later years. And even retrospectively, I criticize him quite a bit. I know I come on the heavier side of that. I'm looking for Ken Holland to do things to get people like me to shut the hell up because I know he's previously been a fantastic general manager, but man, what is this? 
what is he doing with that Edmonton team with Connor McDavid? The worst part about this, we all predicted it as soon as the Duncan Keith trade demand broke. We said, yep, this is this has Ken Holland written all over it. Y- you could set your watch to it. And I didn't even think he would have to pay this high of a price. That's the crazy part. Um, I just, man, the NHL is broken. Like, because it's the same old hockey men doing the same cyclical things and just shooting themselves in the foot over and over and over again. Because what what would the the stat that actually horrified me? Um, because you don't put things like this into perspective immediately. Uh, Connor McDavid will be 26 and Leon Dreisaitl will be 28 by the time Duncan Keith's cap hit comes off the book. Uh, I think Dreisaitl will be one year from UFA and McDavid will be like two or three years from UFA. So he is literally actively hurting their window, having two of the best players on the face of the earth here. And I mean, we've the next thing, if, if, (laughs) if he signs Zach Hyman to too much term and too much money right now, my head might break. I'm not going to sit here and cry for the Edmonton Oilers. You know, from a Red Wings perspective, it doesn't matter. As a hockey fan, I want to see the McDavid window utilized. I want to see McDavid competing for cups. I want to see McDavid in the Stanley Cup finals. I want to see McDavid on the world, on hockey's biggest stage. And it's, yeah, man, I don't know. It's, it, there's not a really a lot of delusion about this trade either. It, it's coming from all angles and for good reason. A trade for an aging veteran who's coming in to stabilize a core more in the locker room than on the ice should not have been this big of a controversy. It really should not have been, but he managed to find a way to fumble it. I have a bunch of random thoughts on it in real, no real organization. Um, I think the biggest sticking point for me is the fact that they couldn't get any salary retained or they the price just was too exorbitant for them. Like it, yeah. that right there just doesn't make any sense to me. Like for all the reasons you guys listed, there should be salary retained for any player. Um, one interesting note I thought was Caleb Jones is actually Seth Jones' brother, so that could be an interesting play by Chicago to kind of entice him to come there if they can't land a Dougie Hamilton. Uh, for I example, I think that's a Seth Jones play specifically. Oh, like just, that's what just, they were aiming to do. Just an aside, I'm actually glad, Evan, you brought that up, is I, it also was reporting today what the trade request uh, would be um, from Columbus for Seth Jones of Chicago. And it started with Kirby Doc and Ian Mitchell and then like a couple picks. There is a reality now where both teams lose this trade horribly because Jesus Christ. Christ, you're going to give that up for one year of Seth Jones? Even if he signs an extension, you're getting robbed blind. You may as well just oh. wait because you know he's going to test the free agent market. Yeah, if that doesn't I mean, it might cost you more, but you won't, you won't lose a Kirby Doc. Like, Ken Holland got fleeced by the same guy who lost three separate Brandon Saad trades. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> The other thing I was thinking about with this trade is Duncan Keith, I think, is still the best player in the trade. So there is some saving grace there, I suppose, if you look at it in a very granular sense. Um, Is he, though? Is he? (laughs) Caleb Jones might be better eventually, but I don't think he is. I I can't imagine Duncan Keith can be as bad as he was this year. Again, maybe he can. I don't know. To be fair, I do expect on a better team in a lesser role Duncan Keith to improve this year so that is very fair but Chicago I could also, also expect Caleb Jones to improve with more ice time yeah Chicago was really bad at five on five so I mean this should help Duncan Keith a little bit um but yeah you brought the Dave Tippett thing in you know the old the good old Canadian boys uh he's so he's playing 25 minutes a night you know if they had retained 20 percent salary I could understand it a little bit more but when you're taking it all on, you know, even though it's reduced cash, it's still the AAV. It just, I'm just glad it's not Detroit anymore. Oh, I just came to the horrifying realization that they're probably going to re-sign Adam Larson for way too much money, probably north of four or five million dollars a year. And their top four could conceivably Look, it will likely be Darnell Nurse, Duncan Keith, Chris Russell, and Adam Larson. And that 
will probably that will be north of 16 million dollars and the other thing is is duncan keith what is he like the third oldest defenseman in the nhl behind andy green and zidane ochara so char doesn't count because he's an absolute freak so he's one of the oldest defensemen in the league you took all that salary on and if you had just waited uh, maybe this is a perfect segue. If you just waited, you could have signed Ryan Suter to anything. Same contract you're paying Duncan Keith. You yeah, can take that. Ochara. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what they're doing because they're going to be stuck with, you know, making decisions on their current roster and trying to add. And they just I don't know where the cap space is going to end up coming from. Uh, they're going to go after Dougie Hamilton. They're not going to be able to sign him unless he. There's some really good museums in Edmonton that I don't know about. Um, <laughs> they could have just signed a guy like Mark Stahl. I think Brad, you mentioned that. Like I just, I feel like there's so many better options, but it's just Ken Holland does this classic thing where he falls in love with a player who is way on the wrong side of of his talent level at this point. Like he's greener pastures or way behind him it just yeah it just doesn't make sense to me yeah well i mean that was a good transition because the one of the other welcome ryan yeah i appreciate that buddy i'll send you your your five bucks um one of the other major pieces of news at all that's come out over the past few days is uh bill Guerin, gm of the minnesota wild made the decision to buy out the remaining four years of the mega 13 year 98 million dollar contracts for both zach parisi and ryan Suter, which that has major cap implications combining the cap hit of the two uh after buyout so this is a cumulative number across both players this is what the minnesota wild are looking at over the next eight years Four points, uh, roughly rough numbers. Uh, over four point seven in dead cap next year, next season. Twelve point seven the season after. Twelve or fourteen point seven the season after that. Then fourteen point seven, and then uh, one point six seven for the four remaining years. So they have a ten uh, ten point three three million dollars savings this year. Two point three three next year. 333 grand, uh, grand for the next two seasons, and then they are down 1.67 million over the remaining four seasons. To have 14.7 million dollars wrapped up in two players not playing for your team, like I get it. You know, if you thought Parisi and Suter don't have a spot on your your Minnesota Wild, then what's the difference? But oh, that is a lot of dead money. Bill Guerin is an absolute animal. This is the biggest swing. I have ever seen in terms of pure cap buyout roster money like that. That is absolutely insane. And I get why they did it. They have Kirill Kaprizov to sign. Apparently they're trying to bring Eichel in. Like they have a lot that they have to do. So the 10 million this year, you're almost saying, screw it. We'll figure it out this year. That's a problem for the future. But holy shit. Is that a lot of money on dead cap? What's Kaprizov going to cost? Eight, nine million dollars long term, or at least for a few years. Eichel's 10 plus million. They can't do that. Not with 14 million dead cap. They have to ride like 12 ELCs that year to make that work. So with Parisi, I think everybody knew this was coming, even though there's teams like Detroit who are willing to take on a sweetener to eat dead cap. Parisi has four years left. That's a lot to take on. So the buyout option for Parisi always made a ton of sense. Um, I don't think anybody was surprised to see that coming. I think it was expected. Suter was the surprising one. The only reason I think they did that was so they could keep Spurgeon, Dumba, Brodeen through the expansion draft. And it solves an expansion issue. I really like Matt Dumba as a player. I don't know that he was he's worth having north of 12 million in dead cap for three plus years. His contract will be over by the time and they'll still be paying Parisi and Suter. Um, if Minnesota was in a position, hypothetically, let's say like Vegas, where we expect to win the Stanley Cup this upcoming season. 
yeah, that's that's a worthwhile gamble. You you take your swing and then you suffer the consequences after. It's like LA is doing with some of their aging contracts. Chicago's went through with some of their aging contracts. We can rip on those contracts all we want. All the dead money they're paying there. They got multiple cups out of it. They don't care. Minnesota ain't that team. Uh, what's the meme these days? You're not that guy, pal. That's the Minnesota Wild right now. Um, I I think they're a good team. I think if they trade for Christian Dvorak or Jack Eichel this year, they're a really good team. I don't think they're a cup contender. Maybe they surprise us. I just, I don't, I don't think it was worth it, at least not from the Ryan Suter standpoint, because even Ryan Suter's up there in age, like, but he's still a very usable, dare I say, good player. Um, Worth his cap hit? Probably not. But, I'd rather pay Ryan Suter too much money to play for my team than to pay $7 million for him to not play for my team. So I I get why they did it. I just really don't agree with it. Yeah, I mean, the expansion draft is the crux of it. You know, as well as needing to fit in Kaprizov. We don't know what's going on with those Kaprizov conversations. Maybe they're expecting a huge number here, right? And so they just, I don't know. The cap's not going to go up. Brad, you mentioned all the right points there. Like, were, were Bill Guerin's hands tied? Maybe to some degree. To this degree, I don't know. It, it almost reeks the same as teams really overreacting and, and giving up a lot to the Vegas Golden Knights at the expansion draft because they didn't want one single bad thing to happen, right? Like a certain player being taken. And all of a sudden, Vegas has like four of their pieces that are all, you know, pushing for the cup. It, it just doesn't – it just feels like a lot. Then again, Bill Guerin has said from the start and he's demonstrated from the start he is not afraid to make big moves like this. So, I, I mean, entertaining for hockey fans, but wow. Ryan Suter, like – this was brought up on, on on Twitter and is brought up in a lot of places. I would love to have Ryan Suter in Detroit for the right price, especially on Moritz Sider's left side. I wouldn't mind that at all for a couple of years. Absolutely. I don't know if he'd come to Detroit. I don't know if Detroit's giving him the money he wants or the situation he wants. But shit, like he was close to coming here when they originally signed. Uh, and if you want a veteran, like a veteran presence who can still play on Moritz Sider's left side, that's great for me. He would be probably the ideal UFA, him or Chara, if you wanted to pair a vet with Cider to teach him the ropes. He's not coming. He's still a good player, so which means he's probably going to command some coin and term. Maybe not term, but coin that the Red Wings aren't going to want to pony up. And he's getting up there. He doesn't have a cup. Like, if I'm him, why that? I'm not considering Detroit. I'm calling Colorado, Vegas, the Islanders. Anybody I think could potentially win a cup this year. And start the bidding war between them and, you know, make my decision from there. I think they also asked Suter to waive his no move. He's got a no move or a no trade. One I think it's a no move. I think they asked him to, to waive it and he said no. So I think it was basically, if you're not doing that, we're going to buy you out. And they called him out on it. So... Yeah, it's crazy, uh, but clearly they've got some some moves that they want to make, and I bet Jack Eichel is is the number one. I think they also need to resign Kevin Fiala maybe as well. So, yep. um, hey, you know what? People may be shocked by it, but Bill Guerin's trying to make moves, and I I'll, I'll fully appreciate him doing what he's got to do and making some of the hard decisions to uh, to try and make it happen. Let's just hope that uh, he. This GM actually talks to the superstar before he makes these kind of moves. <laughs> I, I appreciate Bill Guerin for all the same reasons I appreciate Mark Bergevin. Uh, supremely entertaining, great personalities, awesome dudes, routinely make poor hockey decisions, and uh, two less teams uh, to contend for Stanley Cups when the Red Wings get good. <laughs> Well, uh, in additional news, which we won't cover really um, today, Ottawa has hired Pierre Maguire into a pretty much all-encompassing role, which will feed into a lot of their hockey decisions. Apparently, he reports to Pierre Dorian. We'll see how that one plays out. Um, and Shea Weber might not play hockey next season, period. So that one has massive implications uh, for the Habs, has pretty big implications for the Predators because of cap recapture. Yeah. 
I imagine by the time I hit publish on the, on this, 10 more pieces of news will have come out. So uh, why don't we get into some fun here? Let's jump into our 2021 NHL mock draft with Max Boltman and Prashanth Iyer. Um, always a good time. Uh, we put the guys through hell to, to get this one put together. So I uh, hope you guys appreciate it because if not, they might uh, never agree to be my friend again. So without further ado, that mock draft. In our years of knowing each other, I don't think we have ever put you to through more than trying to get set up for this mock draft we are 26 minutes past <laughs> 26 minutes past when we we when we planned on starting to record uh evan and brad both were using computers for the first time prashant had to leave and rejoin the call about eight times and max we relocated you had you used two different laptops and three different pieces of equipment and we just barely got here it would have been quicker for me to get through the Canadian border, serve my 14-day quarantine, and come to your house. We're so sorry. Uh, we always tell people, like Max and Prashanth, like whenever they, they, they're they like, oh, do you know you know uh, Max Boltman? Or like, do you know Max and Prashanth? I'm like, yeah, they're our friends. And I can't say that anymore. You guys are going to hate us after this. You're never going to agree No, this is actually the proof. Like, I would not have done this for, for someone who was not a friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are we are very much in the red right now. You want to know what the difference is? Is this is the first time you two, either individually or together, have been on uh, an episode with us, the Winged Wheel Podcast, and Evan has been on. So this is true somehow, saying. this is Evan's fault. Speaking of not showing up, this is all Ryan. Ryan forced me to come to this one, so I am here. <laughs> I am ready to be the ultimate wild card. <laughs> I was hoping Evan was going to give me some good golf picks for for the rest of the summer. Good picks, like yeah, for the rest of the for, tournaments. Like, oh, pff, I got lots, but All Ryan doesn't right, let me go. talk about golf on the podcast for that long. Oh, you no, fan. yeah, you get like 180 seconds an episode. That's pretty much it. Did you read Although Brendan I'm... Quinn's Harry Higgs feature today? I did not. It's really good. You should check it out. I will absolutely do that. I don't and there, that concludes 180 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, final 2021 NHL mock draft, uh, joined by Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit, as well as Prashant Iyer, the duo that made up uh, Wings for Breakfast. Guys, we're sorry, and thank you for joining us. No, our pleasure to be here. I think this isn't the first time we've done a pod together since then, is it? It might be. Yeah, it is. I didn't know if we did another one of these. I thought we did one with... With you guys already, but I guess we did them separate. Yeah, yeah, it would have been yeah, separate. Yeah, it was separate. Yeah, I'm just straight up going to title this episode "Wings for Breakfast." Use your old logo and everything just to throw <laughs> people off. <laughs> I was wearing the hat when I was upstairs, but it got lost in the move down down to the other studio, the kitchen studio. All that, and I might get a cease and desist, and I don't want to get on Craig's bad side because I'm still trying to get invited <laughs> to that poker game. So. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, it is the five of us here today. What we will be doing is running through a mock draft of the first 38 picks of the 2021 NHL draft, um, including all three of the Red Wings picks and Arizona's forfeited pick. I know, Prashanth, one of your stipulations was we have to decide how we're going to designate Detroit's second first round pick. It will be the 23rd pick because we will take the time to call Arizona cheaters and talk about how they don't get anyone 11th overall. So... What we're going to do, actually, is uh, draft which teams we will be drafting for. So we're going to take turns running through, uh, and in the top 38, we're going to decide which teams we're drafting for. So um, I think since, Max, you went through the most pain today, you get first dibs as to what team you want to pick for. Oh, yeah, Columbus. We're going right there. Uh, Well, after that, we'll go Prashanth, and we'll go Brad, Evan, and then myself. And we'll just keep rotating through all right, so Max is taking the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, Prashanth is taking Vancouver. Uh, Brad, who are you going with here? Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, Evan, who do you want to pick for? I'll take Seattle. Oh, nice. So Evan is going with Seattle. Just to let you all know, I will pick one of your teams at least twice, probably three <laughs> times. And that also goes for prospects. Yeah, Max mentioned the same thing. He's he was wondering how many repeat picks, but you kind of that's your shtick, so you guys will have to work that one out amongst yourselves. Oh man. Um I'm gonna go with 
I'm going to go with... Sorry, guys. You promised me this part would be quick, Ryan. Make your damn pick. Yeah, I know. I'm going to go with the Devils. I'm going to go with the New Jersey Devils. And now it's your pick again because it's a snake draft. We're doing snake? Yes, that's what we agreed on. We just on. decided right now. Read the rules. All right. So uh, I'll go with the Ottawa Senators. Evan, it is your turn again. Oh, my God. Sorry. Um, I'll go f- with... Um, I'll take Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> Genius. <laughs> you're Genius stuff. A, you're just such a shithead. We're accepting right, that Brad. answer. Yeah. San Jose. Uh, Brad. Brad is going with San Jose. Okay. Prashant. Uh, all right. Let me uh, take the Kings. Prashant is taking the Kings. I'll take Buffalo. And Max is taking Buffalo. And then on the snake, I'll take uh, Calgary. Nice. Uh, we said ducks are still up for grabs, right? Yep. All right, I'm taking the ducks. And Brad is your pick again. Ottawa still up? Ottawa is. No, you no, picked. I Ottawa, have. Ryan. I have Ottawa. Yeah, you have Ottawa. Uh, Chicago then. Chicago for Brad. All right, Evan, your pick. I will take. I'll take Buffalo. Does that has that been said? I got him. Buffalo's oh, well, been said. There we go. Everybody drink. <laughs> um, what about New Jersey? Take him. Take him by me. Everybody drink. It's um, too. Long. You're gonna be plastered. Some <laughs> open ones are Detroit, Philly, Dallas, Philly. New York Rangers, Blue. Take Philly. Okay. Philly for Evan. Uh, I will go with the. I'll go with the Jets here, and then I'm going again. Uh, and why don't I go with Vegas? All right, Evan, you're under the under the gun again. What about? Did anyone take Colorado yet? All right. Uh, Brad? Dallas. No surprise. Brad <laughs> takes Dallas. <laughs> no, Dallas. <starts> <laughs> All right, Prashant. All right. Uh, let me take Montreal here. Montreal goes to Prashant and Max. Uh, Carolina. Carolina goes to Max, and then it's Max again. Boston. Max takes the singular Boston pick, and Prashant again. All right, I'm going to take, um, let's go with St. Louis. They need some help. St. Louis Blues pick 17. Brad? Red Wings. Brad finally does it. We're all dodging it. Brad takes the Red Wings. Uh, Evan? Can I get a list of remaining teams, please? Yeah, you can go Edmonton, Florida, um, Nashville, Nashville, Nashville. And the I'll Rangers. Go Edmonton. Evan will go with Edmonton. Uh, I will take both Nashville and the New York Rangers. And then it's uh, Evan's pick again. And Evan gets Florida. Thank you. Evan gets Florida. All right. So. Can I ask a question? I don't know if this was said, or I probably wasn't listening. What are we going up to in terms of picks into the second round? Pick 38. Excellent. All right. So I'm just going to get us set up here and sort the draft order. So the top 10, just to give everyone an idea, is going to go Max, Evan, Prashanth, uh, myself, Max, Brad, Brad, Prashant, Prashant, and then myself again before Evan makes the very tough pick for uh, Arizona. Brad, just to confirm, you were Minnesota, right? Yeah. That's what we got here. Okay. All right. The 2021 NHL draft 
Let's start this mock. This mock, uh, Max. How are you going to start us off with the Buffalo Sabers? Owen Power. No, uh, no surprises here. Owen Power to the Buffalo Sabers. Max doesn't buy into any of the William Eklund rumors or anything to that effect. Are you guys seeing the Shea Weber stuff right now, or no? What's going on? That they're not going to protect him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like uh, he may not play next season. This is a report from. Renaud Lavoie won't protect Shea Weber for the expansion draft. Following the latest medical evaluations, he could miss all of next season, if not more. Holy. That's what the report Bre- is. Breaking news on the podcast. Well, oh, shit. God, that's Ryan Suter's music. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's a- all, the, all the rumors were to reunite Suter and Weber. <laughs> Nobody thought to replace Suter, uh, Weber with Suter. <laughs> I was going to say that has big cap recapture implications, but they'll just LTIR him. Yeah, I mean, he'll LTIR and he'll be fine. Otherwise, Nashville would really hate themselves. Yeah. Okay. So, Max takes Owen Power and also breaks some huge hockey news on the podcast. I mean, so. I did not break it. Renaud Lavoie did. I just <laughs> relayed it. Max, Max relays some breaking take the credit, news. man. Nobody's going to question it. All right, Evan, uh, second on the board for the Seattle Kraken. Who are you taking? They are going back-to-back Michigan picks, and they're taking Matty Beneers. All right. We are staying as per the general rankings right now. Owen Power, then Matty Beneers uh, goes to the Seattle Kraken. Third for the Anaheim Ducks, Prashanth. Who are you going to go with here? Well, y'all left me the best player in the draft, so I'm taking William Eklund. Prashanth takes – and you told me he was at the top of your board, right? Yeah, I mean, I think he's the best player in the draft. He's got the most skill, most likely for me to be the, the best player out of this out of this draft. Okay, so William Eklund to the Anaheim Ducks. Uh, I'm drafting for the New Jersey Devils. Um, I know some people aren't really buying into the whole Hughes brotherhood thing, but that is enough for me considering the kind of player that Luke Hughes is. So the New Jersey Devils are going to take left-handed defenseman Luke Hughes. All right, Max, your fifth overall pick for the Columbus Blue Jackets and then the next piece of breaking news. Uh, Simon Edvinson. I got no more news for you, though, unfortunately. All right, Simon Edvinson and nothing else because Max is a buzzkill. No, kidding. Uh, Simon Edvinson to the Columbus Blue Jackets. All right, Brad, uh, you're going to pick six for the Red Wings here, and then we're all going to talk about who we would select in this scenario. So Power, Beneers, Eklund, Hughes, and Edvinson are all off the board. Brad, you're Steve Eisenman. Who are you taking? I am going to select sixth overall from the University of Michigan, Kent Johnson. Wow. Okay. I've been high on him all year. This shouldn't surprise anybody. <laughs> Kent Johnson. So what's our what's our initial reaction to the Red Wings taking Kent Johnson at sixth overall with players like Genther available? Uh, Brant Clark is still there. How do we feel about that? I mean, if you're betting on, you know, high high end skill i mean that's that's a it's not a bad bet to make it six but uh you know obviously there's certain question marks with his size and his, how well that's going to translate to the next level but well, i think it's not a bad bet to bet on big skill right like skating more than size for he's six one yeah but he's a little bit on the smaller side from a weight standpoint right like the yeah. frame his build isn't necessarily a big build you can fix that <laughs> do you think he's a center brad I don't think he's a center. Um, I think there's a chance. I'd probably put it at like a 25-75, but I I think he slots in on the winger. Obviously, I'm betting on upside here, but even hammering it down, I know McTavish is the obvious, this is the position of need for the Red Wings. And uh, don't get me wrong, I strongly consider McTavish there as well as uh, Genther and Clark. Um, But from a type of player, the Red Wings don't have a Kent Johnson. They don't have anybody who really compares to what he is, and he is exactly what they need if he hits. So, you know, that set, that creative setup guy on the power play who can play opposite Lucas Raymond, um, it's, an, it's an upside bet. I always believe in drafting for upside. Um, I still think John, I fall in the category of I think Kent Johnson's floor is higher than people give it credit for. I understand the questions about the skating and the size and i'm not dismissing those they're absolutely valid but i have significant questions about everybody who is left at this pick anyway so it's just kind of what do i want to bet on 
when I have huge questions about everybody, and the obvious answer here is skill and hockey IQ, and he's got both of those in spades. He's a great player. I'm not. I'm not uh, second guessing. I just was was clarifying whether you think he's the uh, uh, if you're drafting him to be a center or to be a wing. Like I, I mean, all three of those forwards that you mentioned, I think, are, would be very good picks here. So, does anyone have a pick other than Kent Johnson here that they would make in this scenario? I I think I think in this scenario, I would guess it would be McTavish, but I don't know if that's me making it or me predicting it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that would be my prediction if the board went this way. You guys would think that they would pass on Genther? I, I think there's a very good case. I mean, for me, like, I, if it comes down to, let's say that, uh, let's say it's McTavish going to in the top five instead of Hughes, I could see them taking Hughes, but I could also see it coming down to Genther and Johnson. And then at that point, like, you're just in a really interesting spot. In any case, at this spot, I think there's going to be two or three guys who you're you're weighing different toolkits. Like Brad mentioned, Johnson is the guy they don't really have anyone necessarily similar to in the system. You can look at it that way, and that it's like this is the missing piece, or you can look at it and say they don't draft this type of guy. What should that tell you? Now, I I do think they like they drafted Lucas Raymond last year, super skilled player. Um, you know, if you, as you go deeper into the draft, like Theodore Niederbach is not have like, you know, a grade skating and is a really smart, skilled player. I think you could make a really good case that Kent Johnson is like a souped up Theodore Niederbach kind of situation, um, profile wise, you know, um, and, and he's taller too. So like, I, I think you can make a very good case that Johnson is not like outside their, their prototype by any means. But I also think McTavish, like you can look at and see a really good, like, you know, hard compete, still has skill, still scores, player and that 10 you know that's kind of what i think of as the red wing type of forward at any size um like i think to me the the red wing like the red wings liking size is kind of a theme on the defensive side more than up front mctavish and um johnson were the two that stood out to me there i think evan you brought up a good point with genther but i think with with kent johnson i tend to agree with brad in terms of the amount of skill that's that's there and with the very over overused phrase here of if this guy pans out, he's likely to be one of the most skilled players in the draft, if not the most skilled player in the draft. So to me, I, I don't pass up on that opportunity if William, if William Eklund is off the board, because same as Prashant, same as Brad, and, and probably the same as uh, uh, Max and Evan as well. He's top of the list in terms of who's realistically maybe going to be there for the Red Wings. Then yeah, Johnson's the pick. The margin between Johnson and McTavish to me, though, I can't say that it's so big where it's an obvious pick. I understand you're not supposed to draft for need, but at some point, the Red Wings do need to figure out a solution I, behind Larkin. So if it's McTavish there, by no, I, I couldn't be upset with 10 different guys here. But if it's McTavish, I wouldn't be shocked. And I, I think it'd be great in a different way for the Red Wings. Like that to me, Ryan, what you just said is like... The conversation is always need or best player available, but I don't think that that either of those really captures like a, a key thing of, of positionality in the draft, which is like value. Like, could you make a case that centers are more value? Like a center is more valuable than a winger who may be a little more skilled. I think you totally can based on what those guys go for in free agency and on the trade market. So like, is that drafting for need or is it drafting for value? And I, I think that's a really legitimate distinction that maybe doesn't get raised as often as I, I think it probably ought to. And then the other kind of aspect to that is what's the, actually the gap between the best player available and the position of need? And is it such that you should make that decision? And yeah. like what level of certainty exists? So like you can't, you know, if the best player available is 3% better than the position of need that you need, then it doesn't, doesn't really make that much sense if you don't have that sort of certainty to go that way. So I think that's another thing you have to think about. 100%. And in, in an example of, uh, you know, comparative value to the point where you shouldn't really go crazy over it is look who the Red Wings had available to them when they took Mo Sider. It's Trevor Zegras, who by all rights is panning out super well so far. A lot of people aren't surprised by that. Would have been a great player for the Red Wings. But Red Wings fans can rest easy knowing that at a completely different position, they have an incredible prospect coming through in Mo Sider. So, you know, could Trevor Zegras be 4% better than Mo Sider, however you measure that? Yeah, maybe. But if Mo Sider pans out and turns out to be a top you know, top two defensemen for the Red Wings, you don't particularly care. You know, no, there's no such thing as a perfect draft. There's no such thing as a perfect rebuild. So yeah, excellent points all around. And then, Brian, the other thing I would just say is the other guy that merits consideration in this section is Brant Clark. You know, he hasn't been picked yet. Arguably, 
you know, the second best or third best defenseman, depending on, uh, you know, what, what you're looking at there. And while he's now really in a surplus position, right-handed defenseman, for, you know, which the Red Wings seem to actually finally have a, a handful of and a handful of good ones. Um, he's another guy where if you think you can fix his skating issues, and really the stride, he's a guy that's got a huge, huge upside and, and has to be in the, in the conversation at six. My only thing is he's he's probably the only guy in that mix of top nine guys who you have not seen the Red Wings draft somebody similar. To, yeah. Like in, in terms of the toolkit. like, And that doesn't necessarily mean that he's not better than some of the guys that that are in that mix. But you have not, I, I at least haven't seen the Red Wings draft someone who I would say there's a little – like there's a, there's a Brent Clark analog here. Some of that's because Brent Clark's like way more skilled and all that stuff. But other parts of it is because – even for a guy who has some size to him, like the skating is a legit question. All right. Let's move forward here to the seventh overall pick. Uh, San Jose Sharks, Brad, that is you up again. I specifically picked San Jose because I wanted to, you know, pick. I I figured I'd get stuck between two players uh, when my pick out to Detroit. I actually got stuck between four just because of how the top five worked out. Um, But yeah, no hesitation here if I'm San Jose to take Mason McTavish. All right, Mason McTavish to San Jose, and then Prashanth, you on the next two picks, eighth for LA and ninth for Vancouver. I mean, if you're the Kings, you're, you've already got the best prospect pool, really, in all of hockey. You're loaded with center depth of prospects here, and so seeing the draft break this way and you can add a guy like Brant Clark in, uh, I think is huge for the Kings. And so, you know, even though they do have a handful of, of right-handed defensemen in their system that took Helga Grans last year, um, they've got Jordan Spence in the system, Brock Faber, Sean Dersey. I think, you know, uh, Brent Clark has the potential to be the best of that crop and would be a, a huge addition to Quentin Byfield, Alex Turcotte, Arthur Kelly, and Gabe Velarde. So that's where I'm going here at eight. All right. Brent Clark to the Kings at eight and ninth overall to the Canucks. So ninth overall to the Canucks, you were sort of hoping that I think somebody like this would fall to you. I think, you know, adding a Dylan Genther type uh, to, to, to Vancouver is going to be – huge for them, giving them a bona fide goal scorer that can play, uh, you know, either with Pedersen, away from Pedersen, uh, really, really skilled forward for Vancouver. I think a huge, huge upside pick for them. Okay. 10th overall, the Ottawa Senators. I am incredibly tempted to do the thing and take the goalie here, but uh, we all know that Prashanth is pining for that. So uh, I'm going to go uh, bring in some more skill up front, and they are going to select Chaz Lucius, uh, sentiment out of the USN TDP. All right, uh, Evan, very clever. Your second pick of the draft is for the Arizona Coyotes, and you get to draft nobody because the Arizona Coyotes had to forfeit their pick uh, for breaking the rules. So, Evan, great job on that pick, buddy. All right, uh, Brad, 12th pick for the Chicago Blackhawks. Well, Chicago uh, needs to capitalize on their picks as much as possible because God knows if they're going to have any next year. Um, yeah, so they're in a good position here to take a massive upside pick um, with the uncertainty of how the season's played out. There's a lot of unknowns. Um including in goaltending. But one thing that has left a lot of unknowns is players jumping leagues and thus contributing in multiple leagues. So I think the best value pick here for the Chicago Blackhawks is Cole Sillinger. All right. Cole Sillinger to the Blackhawks. The Calgary Flames, Max. I would like for this to reflect somewhat what is going to happen. So I'm going to... Go ahead and take the goalie for uh, for everybody. Do that as a favor and take Jesper Wallstead. All right. Calgary does it 13th overall. Um, the premier goalie pick. Same with Askarov. Same with Knight. We had to wait a little while. Didn't go. Wasn't a super spicy draft in the top 10. We're going to see Wallstead 13th here, according to Max. I, they're right. In the real draft, there's no way. There's no way think so? he makes it to Calgary. No. I've got... I've got an eye on Ottawa for him. They don't have a lot of stars coming up through the system. They've got a pretty deep prospect pool where they don't have a desperate need for a forward or a desperate need for a defenseman. So they're the first team on the board for me that can really afford to take that swing. I wouldn't if I was them, but I, like I said, I don't think he's getting to 13 here. All right. Uh, 14th for the Philadelphia Flyers. Evan. 
They are going to take Fabian Lysel. Oh, that's a great value pick. Down of 14th. Uh, Fabian Lucell, Lysel? I've heard it both ways. I've uh, primarily Fabian. heard Lucell from. Those you can't change now. my mind. It's Lysel. <laughs> I'm the GM. That's true, yeah. And GMs notoriously always get the names right. Um, okay, Dallas Stars uh, from their number one fan, Brad. Isn't there a Hell picture yeah. of you on the internet in a Dallas Stars jersey? I'm unaware of it. Um, <laughs> um, again, I think most of the teams here at this point, and the way the draft scatter shots, this is where best player available is probably just going to be the mantra for most teams. And um, for me, at this pick, that's Fedor Svechkov. All right. All, a lot of Red Wings fans will be disappointed to hear I'm going that high, but that makes sense. Uh, Fedor Svechkov to the Dallas Stars, 15th overall. Um, this is a pick I honestly didn't think would make it down here for this group. Uh, so pretty excited about that if I'm the New York Rangers. Uh, I'll be taking Brennan Othman. Uh, Canadian had a great U18 uh, left winger out of the OHL. Well, the OHL, so to speak. Given who's still on the board, I don't think it would be a surprise if Othman made it this far. I have him pegged from everything I've been reading somewhere around 20. Well, I thought you guys were way higher on Othman. That's the only reason why. I'm high on Othman, but not this high on Othman. All right. We're back with pick 17. Uh, Prashant, the St. Louis Blues. Uh, it's come to my knowledge that you're really mad at me for taking Brennan Othman. And uh, presumably not because the St. Louis Blues are going to take him. No, the St. Louis Blues have no interest in Brennan Othman. Um, what they do have interest in, though, is finding a right shooting winger that can replace the now disgruntled Vladimir Tarasenko, um, who may be on his way out of town. And so they're going to take Matthew Coronado. <sighs> See, I joked about taking the player that you wanted, and then in turn, I paid the price. Okay, uh, with Coronado off the board, I'm picking for the uh, Winnipeg Jets. Yeah, this one's tough. I'm going to go with uh, Corson Kuhlman's here for the Jets' right-handed defenseman. I would actually be not terribly surprised if he go if he drops that far down, but I think he's someone who's liable to go way higher than people have him picked. So, uh, Corson or Corson Kuhlman's for the Winnipeg Jets. 18th overall. Uh, the Nashville Predators, 19th overall. Who does Nashville go with? Yeah, Pekka Rene just retired, but UC Soros looks like the answer in net for at least long. And they took Askarov. And they took Askarov. That's absolutely right. Um, I already took Brennan Othman. I'm going to go with uh, Borgo out of uh, Shawinigan here. It's Xavier Borgo. Uh, is he a center or a wing? I've seen him listed as... Depends both. who you talk to. I'll list like him as a center. every other forward in this draft. Yeah, I'm going to list him as a centerman just for the sake of having some people listed as centermen. Xavier Borgo to the Preds, uh, 19th. Edmonton Oilers, 20th overall, Evan. Honestly, I'm torn between two players right now. <sighs> Edmonton fans would be doing backflips right now if the draft played out like this. Oh, shut up. No one cares, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're taking Sebastian Casa. Exactly why. Yeah. That, that was, uh, yeah. Wings fans would be a little little devastated if Cosa went three picks away from them. But yeah, I, I don't know if he makes it past Edmonton if he does drop that far. All right. Uh, Max for the Boston Bruins. Carson Lambos. Carson Lambos, nice and easy. The uh, Tim Murray method of drafting there. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? What was it? The one year he was uh, when they took Alex Nylander in Buffalo. There was a betting line over under five and a half words for the pick, and he hit the under. <laughs> Sabers pick. Bu uh, Buffalo Sabers select Alex Nylander. That's all he said. <laughs> Good for him. Just enough words for it to register as a legal pick. So, so the bet was just whether or not he said the. <laughs> yeah. How <laughs> many prepositions did he carry to the draft? Uh, Brad, 22nd overall for the Minnesota Wild. 
again, I'm a big believer in best player available. Um, I know the consensus won't agree with this pick, but this is one of my favorite players from the draft. So the Minnesota Wild are going to select Logan Stankovan. Logan Stankovan up at 22nd overall. And Brad, you are up again. You're Steve Eisenman for the Detroit Red Wings. This is their 23rd overall pick that they got from the Mantha trade uh, to Washington. Who are you taking here? I feel like this is the second time I've picked this guy for the Red Wings in a mock draft, but either way, I'd be happy if it happened. So uh, Eisenman in the past has not had any fear of drafting Russians, so they're going to take Nikita Chibrikov. <laughs> ah, there you go. Every draft, every single mock draft we've ever done, this happens. Oh, God. He I, mean, I mean, he's I, such a fun player. He's their type. He's, he's yeah, so he's good. He's a thousand percent their type. High, high compete level, high hockey IQ. Just he He's not the quickest north-south skater, but he's like Raymond in the sense that he's quick, but not fast, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I, I could see you put him and Lucas Raymond on a line with anybody who can skate in that line could be controlled chaos for days, and I would be a huge fan of it. Is there any consideration for Aturatu here? Yeah, there should be. I mean, he wouldn't. He wasn't far off on my list at this point. Um, have a couple guys ahead of him still, but yeah, you could absolutely consider him here. Play center, you know, and if you're willing to accept this past year as something that not an outlier. I mean, it's a season that happened, but something that you could work on with him, and you don't have immediate demand of the player. Uh, he's someone who could fit in and slot in behind Larkin. You're not exactly wasting draft capital because I think that's a pretty fair valuation for Atu around 23rd overall. And, you know, if he re- regains form is a stupid way to 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 talk about a prospect who hasn't played an NHL game. But if he gets back to where he was projected to before this draft, uh, this draft year, that could be insane value at a pick 23. I'd have a hard time getting away from Ratu here. I'm not going to lie. You have to consider him. I think it's... In the same vein of center, Zach Dean's another guy you have to consider out of the QMJHL here. I mean, he played on a really weak Gatner team, but he's he's loaded. He's got all he's got all of the tools. It's just none of the counting stats because he played on a really crappy team. And so he's a guy if you want to bet on some upside, you put some talent around him. He's maybe another center player that can turn turn things around. Uh, Max, what do you feel about the Chibrikov pick? I love it. I, I think he's a great player. Great pick. I know that's kind of short and sweet, but I, I think I mocked Chibrikov for them in my last mock, too. I think he's a great player. Thanks, Max. All right. Uh, 24th overall is indeed Florida's pick. Uh, Evan, take that away. They are going to potentially bolster their center depth and take Francesco Pinelli. All right. Another possible player um, who is linked to Detroit at 23rd uh, would go to Florida at 24th. I- I totally thought Brad would take him with Detroit's pick there just because he's such a Rangers homer, but, you know, I still like his pick. Yeah. See, you say I'm a Rangers homer, and I absolutely am, but I've never once let it influence my rankings. Yeah, you weren't entirely high on Pinelli either. Like, uh, he's, I, I have him ranked close to here, but that's about the consensus for him. I'm not too far off everybody else on him. All right, picking back up here, I'm not going to pretend there weren't 100 edits on the way because my draft list is completely messed up. Uh, Max, 25th overall, please, please, for the Is Columbus it too group. much of a gimme to go with Yarmo Kekalainen and taking the swing on Atu Ratu once the the presumptive number one in this class and fell off and now he's sitting here in the 20s and yarmo has got picks? I'm, I'm taking Ratu for the Blue Jackets. I'd be you have shocked to. if Yarmo didn't have take to. him. Yeah. Especially considering uh, people saying he reached way too far last year in the first round, this is him getting that value back with a guy who dropped. Yeah, because if you take Edmondson in the first, you know, with your first pick there, then you know you got to come back with the center. Someone's got to play with Patrick Line. Eh? <laughs> if he stays, if he stays, twenty-six overall, Brad for the Minnesota Wild. Uh, fun one here. Uh, most. One of the most fascinating prospects in the draft for me because it's that age-old debate of how good does the scale have to be and how high does the hockey IQ have to be to cancel out some pretty poor skating. I think with this player, the two, first two are exceptionally high. So I'm going to take Sasha Pastajov. All right, Sasha Pastajov. 
Um, that's another player a lot of Red Wings fans are hoping is there at pick 38. Uh, Brad takes him off the board at 26 for the Wild. Uh, Max, we are back to you for the Carolina Hurricanes, 27th overall. Isaac Rosen. Isaac Rosen. Okay. Uh, Evan for the Colorado Avalanche, 28th overall. Max, you always have to pick, take a long time with your pick when it's before me. <laughs> to give you some I have time. no idea what I got a vamp for you to, to, to get your board in order. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm striking off names that I thought were ta- that weren't that were taken and they were gone 20 picks ago. <laughs> um, Colorado, obviously weak at every position. Um, they are going to take... Uh, is Oscar Olison still on the board? Oh, yeah, he's still there. Go How does it feel, Ryan, to be me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't look like you, and I'm not as rich as you, and I'm not as popular as you, so it kind of sucks right now. Not going to lie to you, buddy. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, the New Jersey Devils, uh, 29th overall. Now that Oscar Olison has come off the board, I have to pivot here. <sighs> oh, man. Evan, it sucks being you. I know. Okay. Uh, the Devils are going to take... Have we taken Zach Bolduc yet? Yes. No, wait, Borgo. Borgo's gone. No, we have not taken Zach Bolduc yet. Zach Bolduc is going to come off the board here uh, for the New Jersey Devils. Uh, that's a pick that they got from the New York Islanders. And 30th overall for the Vegas Golden Knights. This is an interesting one. If I'm Vegas, um, it's incredibly tough. I'm going to go with uh, Simon Robertson out of Sheleftia. All right. Montreal Canadiens, Prashant. Well, you guys have certainly not made this easy. Um, I mean, getting all the way down to this point, I think I'm going to have to go with Zach Dean over here. I'm not sure there's too many uh, skaters better than him left. Okay. Zach Dean to the Habs. Uh, Columbus Blue Jackets. That is Max. Kirill Krasanov, SKA. Kirill the Thrill. And then uh, Max again for the Buffalo Sabres in your best Tim Murray style. Hmm. Wyatt Johnston. Wyatt Johnston. Oh, man, buying into the height. Uh, Wyatt Johnston to the Buffalo Sabres. Prashanth for the Anaheim Ducks. Oh, man. What do I want to do from Anaheim here? Let's see. Suppose I could take a flyer on a defenseman, and uh, let's see if we can fix Daniel Cheka. Daniel Cheka. Again, I third. am actually shocked for Sean there's a guy who ended up taking Cheka. I mean, I don't like it, but you know, <laughs> let's just let's just move past it. There was nobody else, you know, maybe Sposal that I could take here, Evan Nouse, but no. I think I think Cheka is a guy if you put him around the right people, maybe you like them last year. What's going on, but man, he didn't look great this year. You liked him last year though, right? I did. Look at last year looking at his numbers in the OHL, he looked great. And I thought he was going to have a really nice season and I don't know if just the transition completely messed him up, but he did not look like he knew how to play hockey at points this year. But there is something there. All right. 35th overall to the Seattle Kraken. Evan, who are you going with? Going to work on my French here a little bit. They are taking Zachary LaRue. Zachary. (laughs) Ah, yes. Those 10 years of French they make us take really paid off there. (laughs) Yeah, they stick. Definitely they stick. Uh, Zach LaRue, you know, used to be considered pretty high up in the first round, but he's a guy who presents a lot of question marks in different ways. So he'll go to Seattle, 35th overall. Uh, The Vegas Golden Knights at 36th. I think they'd be pretty pumped to have Samuskevich there. So they'll go with Mackie Samuskevich. And then 37th overall for Evan. Damn it, Ryan, you didn't speak slow enough. I, I um, can't embarrass myself next to Max. He goes so fast. I know, I just, that's true. Um, I'm just going to pull a name that I recognize that I think will be there. Samu Tuamala. Tuamala. 
Okay, everyone's nodding their heads, so I'm a genius. <laughs> yep. Brad's devastated because I think he was looking at him for for Detroit. <laughs> yeah, he was looking at him for pick 38. All right, Brad, pick 38, the Detroit Red Wings, they're the first of their second round picks. Who are they going with here? You guys had a run there a few picks ago where I really liked the way it was shaping up. And then uh, Tuamala, LaRue, and Samoskovich coming off the board stung. Um, bit of a reach here, but I'm a big fan of the player. Um, high hockey IQ matched up with production. I'm going to stay in Finland. And I'm going to take Vili Koivinen. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to take him, and I actually agree. That's who I would mock for, for the Red Wings here as well. Any other thoughts on the Koivinen pick? Would you guys go in any different direction? Uh, for the Red Wings in the second round. It's an interesting one. Uh, I mean, Koivinen's a good pick. You could stick with Samu Salmanen. I mean, I think that's another solid pick. Uh, you know, Kisikov in the MHL, I think he's a heck of a goal scorer. Questions if he can still get to the front of the net same rate in other leagues. But, I mean, he's another guy with a lot of upsides. Uh, Ayrton Martino is another guy with a lot of skill. I mean, there's just there's so many options here. It's just, I don't know what's going to be the right answer, but I think there's any one of five or six guys you could put in this spot here. I think the one thing with how I picked for the wings here that I don't think is going to happen on draft day is I pick three forwards with the first three picks. And I don't think that's going to be entirely likely. I I would, I, I'd give a lot of consideration to Sean Barron's here personally as well, but I think he'll be later in the second round. So you could almost make the gamble that you can get them with your next second round pick uh, potentially. But if they were to swear on a defense here, that probably would have been my pick. Stanislav uh, Svozl, how does that read to you for this pick? Left-handed defenseman might fill a need for the Red Wings. Some people have him as a first round talent. I think it'd be a little high for me. Like I think that'd be a little early for me for him, but I don't, I mean, I would, I think if you're going to go with a D, and Prashant, I know this is your guy. Alexi Hamel Salmi would be kind of in the in the lane that I would be looking at personally. Yeah, I think Hamel Salmi, Alexi Malinen, there are a couple of guys later in the second round. You might be able to see Artem Grushnikov is another guy you might be able to see little later in the second round. So, you know, they're they're all solid players that are still available. I mean, Sposal is a really interesting case because going over the or in the, in the Czech league this year, if you if you just split his season by first half and second half. His first half sucked, and his second half looked a lot better. So it's if you're swinging on him, you're hoping that everything sort of maybe he started to click and, and, and figured out what he was doing over there. But uh, it is still definitely a risky, a risky swing on a guy with very little certainty. I think here. All right, so that is the first 38 picks of the 2021 NHL draft mocked. Um, most notably for the Red Wings, we mocked Kent Johnson, uh, we mocked Nikita Chibrikov, and we mocked uh, Koivinen. So uh, Brad um, was the one who had the recorded picks, but of course we all gave our discussion there. Uh, Max, Prashant, any parting thoughts uh, as we approach the 2021 draft? Um, kind of what to expect, your thoughts about how things might go in general, what's what's sticking in your mind? Well, I think we talked about it off air um, and during one of the many times where things cut out. Um, the, 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 there's that group of top nine skaters and almost all of them fit for Detroit. Like there's really not – maybe Brant Clark uh, just being a different kind of defenseman than we've seen the Red Wings take. But almost everybody else, they have a couple of traits that, that have kind of proven to be themes for the Red Wings at various points in the first couple of rounds of the draft. Like – it could go a lot of different ways. And I think there's a lot of really good prospects of a similar caliber there. Like I think there's, you know, it, it could go a lot of directions. And I, you know, this is the, the cliche that they're, they're going to get one of those nine guys. It's going to be a really good prospect. Yeah. I think uh, outside of those top nine, all hell is going to break loose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have no, I think that's the biggest thing between all of our discussions here is there are five or six guys. You can consider it really every pick from 11 on. Like, you take the top nine skaters, you take the two goalies, and then everything else is up for grabs. I think you're going to see some of the widest variety of lists, you know, guys that maybe some teams would have, you know, third round grades on going in the first round and vice versa. So it's going to be really, really interesting from pick 11 onwards. And that's where I think Eiserman's strategy of just having a lot of picks is going to be fascinating because 
you're going to get a lot of swings at guys uh, that a lot of people maybe don't have as much information on. So I wrote an article uh, this week about possible trade up scenarios. I don't know if you guys had a chance to look at it, but do you think there's, you know, good reason for the Red Wings to trade up a few spots or, or even several spots from the second pick? Uh, or conversely, do you think there's any reason to trade back from the number six pick and into, you know, whether that's at LA, Vancouver, something else there? I think that for all the reasons Prashanth just laid out there, this is not the draft to trade up. Value is going to fall. Um, just because of the wide variance in list, there's a good chance whoever Detroit picks at 23 is going to be top 15 on their board, almost certainly. Um, they already have so many picks it couldn't hurt to take a few more swings i would consider if they are trading back to look for future picks like take whatever pick you get in this draft so if you're trading back from 23 hypothetically for let's say 28 i would hope i would go for a 2022 second as the kicker there not necessarily uh one this year just to kind of spread the value out kick some elcs down the road um maybe if you're uncertain if you're not comfortable with the uncertainty of this year Next year's gives you a bit more certainty. I don't know. You could make that argument both ways. Um, but yeah, I think this is the ultimate draft to trade back. If if San Jose or LA or Vancouver comes calling for Detroit at six, I'm absolutely considering it because you'd probably get some pretty good value for going back only a couple spots. Uh, so yeah, Max, just building off of what you just, uh, what Brad had just said, I think the whole reason not to trade up here is one league in particular didn't get a lot of guys... Uh, placed in other areas, and that's the OHL. And so there are guys who may have had Jack Quinn type of rises. You know, Jack Quinn goes from 12 goals in his D, you know, D minus one to 52 goals in his draft year. And you see that, and all of a sudden now he's a top 10 pick. And there are guys where maybe they didn't necessarily get placed in ideal situations uh, to, to show that. And they're the kind of guys that might slip, and, and you may be able to, to pick those guys up. I mean, uh, the what the, the Swedish Junior League stopped early in, in, in November, December. So there's a lot of development. I just don't think you got to see uh, over the course of the year. And I think it just makes the risk of trading up not worth it, in my opinion. You know, before the draft, I would have wholeheartedly agree. And I think on balance, I still really do. But Max, I read your piece and there were some interesting points there. And it really made me think. I don't. I don't really care to move up too much from pick six. I don't think that's worth the capital it would take. I think Brad's right. It, you'd probably get a lot of value to move back there, but to move up from pick twenty three, there are some tempting things. Like if you're a believer in Kosa, I don't mind spending a little bit of the mountain of draft capital that Eisenman's accrued uh, to move up to grab that pick. Like if they're a big believer in someone, you know, Prashant, you mentioned it. The top. Nine or ten skaters are there. The top two goalies are there. Then everything is wild. So you might get a guy who's top ten on your board who's there at pick 21, 22. Then why not? Why not spend that extra little bit of capital? Uh, Steve Eisman, you know, spent a seventh-round pick to move up one spot to take Braden Point. Obviously, that's a straw man. Like, I, I'm taking the most extreme example here. But he's no stranger to taking his guy when he wants him. So, yeah, it's easy to put this draft in a hole and say it's not as good as 20, 2022 or 2023. And... Of course, I'd prefer to get first round picks from those years, but I think there's a lot of, of, of probably undervalued scenarios scenarios here where it might be prudent for the Red Wings to at least take a look at. And with the uncertainty and the way circumstances could line up, like to take a hypothetical, not saying this would happen exactly, you look at a, a goaltending needy team like Ottawa who has a surplus of prospects and picks so they can afford to unload some extras. If they want to jump up from 10 to 6 to ensure themselves Wallstead and Detroit goes back to 10, they're still getting one of the quote-unquote top nine guys, and they probably get a early second-round pick out of it to do that. And In my opinion, they'd be crazy not to because at that point, it doesn't matter which one of Genther or Clark or... Eklund or Edvinson falls to you, you're getting one of them and you're going to get a really damn good prospect on top of that as well. Again, that's just one example. You never know. It could be Chicago trying to jump up or uh, I don't know, possibly Vancouver make your pick. It could be any team, but yeah, I think this is the draft to be open-minded and there's a million possibilities. 
All right. Well, read about those possibilities on the Athletic Detroit. Max outlined a great article. Uh, Red Wings draft uh, three trade-up scenarios from pick 23 and how they'd work. Uh, by the time you're listening to this episode, Max will probably have his What I'm Hearing article out as well. Um, and lots of great draft content to come there. Uh, Max, thank you so much. Prashanth, thank you so much. Uh, guys, I promise you next time we do this, it'll be better. Um, maybe. <laughs> maybe maybe we just suck up and buy that house in Detroit so we don't have to do this remotely anymore. It went great as long as soon as we got through the the firewall uh, security system. So like that well, went good. We can't have you schlups invading the Wing Wheel <laughs> podcast. That's why we have it all up there. No, it's it's actually just a test to make sure Evan's conscious because if he's if he tries to do the podcast asleep, which he often does, he won't be able to make it through those. That's genius. <laughs> yeah. It almost got right, me. everyone. Well, uh, Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit, uh, Prashanth Iyer as well. Thank you guys so much, and until next time. And that was our mock draft with uh, Max and Prashanth. Um, always good to have them on. Hope you guys enjoyed or hated the picks one way or another. Let us know what you thought, especially the Red Wings picks. Uh, let's jump into overtime. We're going to try to squeeze in some overtime questions here. Um, we weren't originally planning to this episode, but uh, we got a few, and... Yeah, why not? Um, patrons, stay tuned for an extra post for the draft preview episode that will be coming out on Sunday, but the overtime questions aren't, uh, are, we're going to take them on Thursday, which is for us tomorrow, maybe by the time you're listening to it today. Who knows? Uh, League Maximum Fine of $5 says, uh, always pumped for the content. What's your favorite superhero movie? Uh, oh, there's so many options. If I had to boil it down to one, Ragnarok. Oh, Ragnarok's a good one. I'm a big Iron Man one fan. I love the Christopher Nolan Batman's. That was mine. The Chris, yeah, the Christopher Nolan Batman's good. And I mean, from a you know critically acclaimed standpoint, it wasn't the best. But I mean, how could you not watch Endgame over and over again? Like a movie like that may not not exist in Hollywood again for fifty years. Just with Every, all the build up to that one movie. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I know you fucking haven't. <laughs> uh, Michael Berry says if the Devils draft Luke Hughes, what are the chances the Devils offer sheet Quinn Hughes? Asking to see if Vancouver would become more eager to offload some of their bad contracts. Uh, Quinn Hughes is not eligible for an offer sheet. Yeah, otherwise we'd uh, it would be very very tempting. Uh, Colorado 14 er says alternate universe where Suter signs with Detroit instead of Minnesota are the 2012, 2013 Red Wings Stanley cup champions. No, no, no. do you know? Okay. It was a fun run while it lasted, but like, no, <laughs> Chicago won the cup that year and Detroit had him three, one. Yeah. And if you replay that series a hundred times, Detroit will lose 99 of them. <laughs> Uh, Even with Suter and Parisi, Chicago was a buzzsaw back then. It was a miracle they got to seven games. Uh, Aaron Hudson says, Landis Cog, yes or no? Um, selfish way, yeah. I, I love Landis Cog as a player. In terms of what he'll cost and you know what he would do for the Red Wings timeline right now, I don't think it makes a ton of sense. Landis Cog might be my favorite player out of Detroit. Former captain of the Kitchener Rangers. You know, one of my obviously my junior team. I love the way he plays. Um, I I think he's going to price and himself way the hell out of Detroit. <laughs> yeah, he'll be he'll be 29 pretty much right when next season starts. And again, it's not like 29 year olds can't play hockey. That's not it. But he'll then be what 32, 33 before Detroit's sniffing serious playoff contention. Yeah, no, that's that's one to avoid, like the plague. Ghost of Podcast Pass says, who's going to be the next P.K. Subban in the league? Who's considered among the top of their position, but it's going to fall off a cliff in the next couple of seasons. Maybe not Jeez. P.K. Subban level, but we're going to see a lot more regression in in Steven Stamkos. And I think it's going to be a lot more apparent how he's not one of the absolute main pieces in Tampa. Man, it's such a big league. I'm having a hard time narrowing it down. Stamkos is a a really good bet. Not that he's a superstar, uh, but because of his contract, I can see a lot of Ranger fans turning on him very quickly. And to me, that's going to be Jacob Truba. Yeah, that hasn't already happened. Uh, Zadina's World says, sign Suter to Mentor Cider, assuming short-term contract under 
2.5 AAV. I don't think he's signing for for that little. Nope. Honestly, absolutely he, like, not. Suter is still a good player, like he is. So he, he can still produce on the ice. Mike Franklin says, "Would you package one of our seconds with the Washington first to move up for Sebastian Cosa if he falls?" Absolutely not. I'm not going to say absolutely not. I I almost have a a thought for it, but probably I won't end up doing it just because I don't know how big this the Kosa hype is. Um okay. Kyle Hashman's has been a it's been a crazy few weeks. Finally have time to respond uh before the episode. I had a golf weekend at some really nice courses. I went by myself. First round was great because it was super early and blew through the course. Others, not so much. What's the protocol for uh, being paired up with a group or going solo? What do you mean? Like, like you're, if it- you're a solo person, you either play through a group in front of you or you're supposed, typically supposed to join the group around you, like behind you, if there's a group of four in front of you. Generally, if there's a group of four in front of you consistently, you should just pair up with the people behind you because you're screwing up the pace of play for everyone else behind you. It's always generally preferred for a experience, good experience for everyone to pair up. Hmm. Who knew? I don't like like if I'm going out golfing alone. I don't know. I don't really want to talk to other people. I probably made that decision. I just want to hang out by myself. But yeah, I get that. It's kind of shitty to take up a whole hole just for one person. You're standing there waiting. People are both standing there waiting behind you. You make the group in front of you, then is wondering why there's a solo person playing behind them. It's just a everybody gets off their game at that point, and it's just better to group up. All right. Arjun Shanker asks, who is the highest skill, lowest cap player that Seattle could take from Toronto to cause the biggest headache? Assuming um, Toronto makes logical decisions with their protection list, probably... Dermot. Yeah. Their protection list isn't easy, but I don't think it's particularly crazy where they're gonna make like a massive splash, right? With the who they take. They're they're gonna lose Dermot, Hole, or Kerfoot. It's not gonna be super consequential. Yeah, I mean I think those guys are consequential. I think they're good, but not super consequential. They have guys in their system that could fill those spots. Dermot's the answer there just because of his age. And and what Toronto needs, right? A defense. So, uh, Yakaruta says Tampa is going to keep winning as long as they can create players like you can in EA's NHL series. I mean, am I supposed to believe Ross Colton is a real player? No one's even heard of him before the season, and then the guy scores the cup winning goal. Come on, some dude who's from a clearly fake town and looks like a randomly generated guy. Also, they keep signing undrafted players like Johnson, Gord, and Verhage, who turn out to be very good players. Not fair. Um. English major says, sup guys, got my questions answered on 31 thoughts. Just asking about any info for the wings. So if you need an in with Elliot, I'm your guy. Uh, we've seen the Toronto Bertuzzi make uh, made up trade offers. What's a fair trade for Bertuzzi to the Kings? Thanks. Uh, Byfield straight up. Yeah, no. Um, uh, I'd be looking at 2022 or 2023 first because LA is hoping to be a better team. So maybe they're thinking those aren't lottery picks and they have all their first round picks for the next few years. So I think their prospect pool is so deep. They're like more likely to pick out of there. Um, I don't know. I I don't think it would be crazy to be able to pry away a Turcotte or a Kaliev from them in a Bertuzzi deal. That'd be tough. I I think they would not want to sell on Turcotte that quickly. They probably value him I don't, pretty much the same as the draft. Yes, but they're also acquiring a legit first line winger who can play with Quinton Byfield or Anze Kopitar. Like again, let's not sell Bertuzzi short here. Uh, Chris B says, "What's more likely, Lucelle falls to pick twenty three, or Stankovan falls to thirty eight? Lucelle, I'd say Lucelle twenty three. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. more likely." Uh, Mike Hernelstein says more morning recordings, please. Uh, we can, as we are able to, we promise, um, Sunday's episode will go up in the morning, but that's cause we're pre-recording it. So, um, generally what happens during the season is there's a lot of Red Wings games on Sunday afternoons. And so we used to do it in the past, but then we just get burned cause news would get old real fast. So as we're able to, we will, I know Evan loves it. He can, 
record then tea time. Uh, Kyle Archambeau says, do the wings get their hands on Ryan Suter? They might try. Um, I don't know. I'm just going to keep reporting the, repeating the point. Players have to want to come here. And the Red Wings are not a cup contender. So that eliminates 75% of half-decent free agents. Which specific ones? We don't know what's going on in their head. But until they get good, they're not a destination. A guy like Ryan Suter probably has no interest in coming to Detroit. Unless he has like some family in Ann Arbor that we don't know about. Uh, Eric Boyle says, when the Wings win their next cup, which player is going to put the biggest dent in it during the celebrations? Don't tell me that none of the players on the team are here yet because I don't want to hear it. Uh, it's Tyler Bertuzzi. <laughs> if he doesn't get traded, it's absolutely Tyler Bertuzzi. <laughs> uh, Patrick Modrowski says, hey, guys, I've been a fan for a while, but finally felt I was in a place to offer a little bit of support. Patrick, thank you so much and welcome to the Dub Dub family. Decided to go back uh, and listen to the beginning and my God, some of those takes are incredible. My favorites include Ryan saying he trusts uh, every Ken Holland move. All three of you saying Riley Shahan was the best kept secret in the league. And Brad saying he hated the Larkin pick. And Brad again saying the future looked bright with Larkin uh, as 2C playing with Shahan and Polkanen on the first line. However, I think the worst take I heard on that episode was Brad pronouncing GIF as JIF. Oh, man. Unfortunately, Brad hasn't outgrown that last one. He still does say JIF. So. We weren't recording when... We didn't have a podcast when Larkin was picked. That was 2014. Oh, but you probably talked about it retroactively. Oh, I talked. Yeah, I didn't like the pick at the time, given some of the players who were still on the board. Um, obviously, it's come around, so no complaints here. But you still say GIF, huh? No, not really anymore. I usually will say GIF or GIF just to satisfy everybody, because <laughs> these are the type of internet uh, little quibbles that I do not give a shit about. Uh. Clint Banesh says, uh, has anyone asked about Suter or Parisi? <laughs> good joke. Uh, and I'm Devin says, I'm a firm believer that good managers attract good employees and good employees can attract good managers. With that said, Detroit's goaltending future is kind of a shit show. So if everything lines up, could Detroit take Wallstedt with six and Kos uh, Koso with 23rd? What having um, two top end prospects or would having two top end prospects attract a better goalie coach slash develop slash development system. If this did happen, how happy or mad would you be? Oh, I'd get wasted. Cause that's the only way I could possibly comprehend that. You know, two I first round picks on a goalie so much. Not the question. I hate this hypothetical so much. <laughs> I think I understand what you're saying, but I think, the Red Wings would build out the development. And if they had a problem with their, their goalie coach or their goalie development, which I'm not saying that they do, but they would handle that before drafting those guys. Cause then you run the risk of drafting those guys and not being able to do anything with them. Uh, the actual Terry says, I have a five-year-old whose name is Evan and a two and a half year old name whose name is Hannah. I frequently listen to you doinks in the car with them. And the other day, my son goes, Hey dad, why are they always saying, uh, my sister and my names? Uh, apparently my children are actually paying attention to you guys. So I'm going to have to le uh, cut down on my listening since you guys are far from family friendly. In fact, the least family friendly one is the one with children. <laughs> well, uh, hello to Evan and hello to Hannah. Um, please be good and listen to, uh, your parents. Um, and we're sorry, but that's just the way Brad is. We have really cut it down. I don't swear all that much at all anymore, truthfully. And uh, honestly, Mika drops more F-bombs at this point than Evan, because to me, swear words are arbitrary and it's stupid to me that that's a thing in society. But that's a bigger conversation that I'm not having. Ken Holland says, Duncan Keith shirtless, aging defenseman rule 34. <laughs> How to tell the difference between a Patreon comment and a Google search. How to delete a Patreon comment. Oh, thank you for that one. That was a ride, <laughs> Ken. Uh, Sam W says, what have you seen in your viewings of Kent Johnson that makes you believe his skills or style will transfer to a more disciplined, tighter gameplay in the NHL? And does anything in particular give you a reason to believe he could be a center at the next level? Okay, I'm I'm just going to answer this question because this would be a very, very long, nuanced question. So I'll just take a, a stupid metaphor that I hear a lot in the scouting world to kind of analogize it. It's easier to tame a lion than to train up a kitten. You can take a guy with all the tools that Ken Johnson has and teach him to play defense and teach him to play within structure. You cannot take a guy... Um, 
who doesn't have Kent Johnson's skill and give him Kent Johnson's skill, no matter how defensively responsible he is. Yeah. What I've seen to say that he'll definitely translate to the NHL, I don't know. I really struggle with with guys like him. There is a a litany. There's a, a giant pile of players who had all the skill and never translated it to the NHL, and less skilled players made it because they were able to do it. I, I don't know that that gets thrown around a lot. But when you actually go back and look at the players who were advertised as high skill and drafted in the top ten, very few have not turned into usable NHLers. Not all of reach your ceilings. The ones in the top 10 that have whiffed were the opposite picks, the good, reliable two-way forward, the, you know, bruising defenseman, the Dylan McElrath, the Scott Glennies of the world. Those are the guys that turn out to be the top 10 bus, not the other way around. You do have your odd Nikita Filatovs and, and so on and so forth. I'm not saying it never happens, but more frequently, it's the inverse. All right. Uh, next question here is from Hey Evan. Hey Evan, what's an unwritten rule that you believe everyone should know and follow? Unwritten rule in life? I don't know. Use your manners. Hold the door for people. Help the elderly when you can. That's it. Know. There's eh. no golf unwritten rule. Fix your fucking ball marks. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. I swore. I know you don't like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh god uh steve eisman should call ken hall and says edmonton starting five is going to take up 36 million in cap space which sounds like it could be deadly and then you realize it's zach hyman zach cassie and duncan keith darnell nurse and connor mcdavid can't wait to see stevie trade bertuzzi for holloway benson and pick 20 uh the caminator says with the potential of three u of m grads in the first 10 picks how would a team of only michigan grads do in the nhl stay fresh cheese bags aussie for hall um not you know bad. not terrible you got uh larkin you have well Patrick speaking Reddy. of zach Hi- yeah patch ready zach hyman uh warensky's there truba's there john merrill, john merrill. Who's uh, oh let me look up the might be the issue well, it's not perfect. Uh, maybe man. They signed man. Yeah. Who else? Carl Haglin for some depth. Cam and York. Or- oh, did you say Kyle Connor already? No, I didn't say Kyle Connor. Kyle Connor. Actually, Andrew Tru- Cop for that matter. Tru- yep. Jacob Truba. Yep. So this team Truba. could be all right. Not bad. Not a cup contender, but could be all right. Uh, vaxed, wax, and grateful to be free of the scourge that is Regis Pierre McBalsack says, Hey there, fellas, can we just take a moment and acknowledge how these last three days have been absolutely bananas? The thing with center depth is that if you need centers, you have to draft them. Centers be- can become wingers. Wingers don't become centers. Look at these playoffs as a perfect example. Hashtag Mason McTavish to the moon. Yeah. So the one thing I have to be clear about, because I see this, if you read every scouting report, and dive in deep with a variety of opinions, there is exactly one centerman in this draft that every scout agrees is going to be a center at the NHL level, and that's Matt Beneers. There is doubt about every other one. So obviously you have some better bets than others like Svechkov and McTavish, but there's no guarantees in this draft. So... If you're drafting McTavish solely because he's a center, that's a bad opinion. I'm sorry. It's a bad opinion. Now, if you think he's a legit good player and his skills can translate to center, great. All the power to you. You absolutely can put weight into that. But nobody in this draft is a sure thing. Every single prospect in this draft has serious questions around their game, except for, in my opinion, three players so we're picking six we're gonna have to settle on something whether we want to or not uh josh terrell says are there any evolving thoughts on shot blocking i can't see in an age of analytics that it makes sense to jump in front of a shea lobsing or 100 mile per hour point blast which risks missed games missed shifts or reduce performance from injury all for one potential block curious on your thoughts thanks fellas Unfortunately, it's needed, especially in high-pressure situations. 
this is the argument for having defensive specialists for end of game scenarios. Like I've never complained about putting Luke Glendening out in the final minute of a one goal lead because one, he's good at it. Two, not to sound callous, but if anybody's going to get hurt blocking a shot, it's better to be Luke Glendening than Dylan Larkin. I'm not telling Larkin to lay down in front of any shot ever, but I'm also not putting Larkin in too many scenarios where he's going to have to. So there is a time and a place for it. There is a necessity to it. You just got to be very care- careful about who's doing it. All right. And last one here is from Florida Man who says, had a pretty shit week so far. Was thrown off my kayak a mile offshore and lost my phone and some fishing gear. Oh, shit. Uh, then the same day, my family tested positive for COVID. Looking forward to more craziness on hockey Twitter. How's your week been? Well, um, I was complaining until I read that. It's been better than yours, so I'm really sorry about all of that. Uh, thank you for the perspective. Um, I got news that my gym and a lot of arenas are opening up, so I, I've been in a reasonably good mood, even if I don't get to use them right away. My golf clubs are delayed another three to four weeks, so I might just um, go nuclear somewhere. <laughs> I knew you I did, I did order new custom hockey skates and a new stick. So, yeah, I'm actually having a pretty good week. Thanks for reminding me. Sorry about your luck. That sucks. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, we're going to wrap up the episode there. Again, uh, thank you to Max and Prashanth for coming on for the mock draft. Sunday, you are going to hear our final draft preview. Uh, We're going to pre-record that episode as of Thursday. So patrons, get your overtime comments in for that one. Uh, On Thursday, you'll see the post come in either Thursday morning or late Wednesday night. Uh, Sorry for the confusion, but thank you all so much for bearing with us. So, so, so much content to come. Uh, We'd like to thank our name level sponsors, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Brett Bailey, King Tone, Terry, Driver of Cry and Ryan, Hannah's Banana Slam and Jamathong, Taylor Tadgel, Brandon M, Citizen High Five, Craig Kibble, Greech, Hannah Lee, Hassam al Jacob Turner, Jake Kiefer, Joe Santangelo, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kaylin Wood, Cody Stark, Kyle Hashman, Kyle McClure, Matt McKay, Matthew M. Rice, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Stacey Lynn, Zach Spring, uh, Andrew Bohan, Sam Bankson, Adam, I wish I could finish like Ernie, another former junior goalie turned golfer, Antonio Gracias, Bob Mortimer's hand lion, Brad uh, Fruct and Ostrich, allegedly, Colorado 14ers, Connor Halayton and Dave W. Evans Bingo Card, Jeremy Brocker, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Matt Keeler, as good as it gets, Trevor Pevavar, Vaxed, waxed, and grateful to be free of the scourge that is Regis Pierre McGuire. Thank you all so much. Talk to you Sunday. Kind of. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.